What do you think is the biggest problem people are facing today? Well, for me, when I pray, I have a problem with trust. I feel like I can't just get up off my knees and believe. I, I have to do something in order to deserve an answer to prayer. Kind of a barter for a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I would. I'm Lloyd Ogilvy. When you were Stay tuned for a power-packed program about how to get beyond bartering for God's blessing and on to a victorious life. Prayer is conversation with God. And yet there are many times when that conversation becomes strained and ineffective on our part. On today's program, I'm going to talk about one of the greatest impediments to powerful prayer. It's that old idea that God will hear and answer our prayers only if our lives are perfect and in order. I have a very liberating secret to tell you about how to get beyond that self-justification that cripples our praying. Now, let's go into the sanctuary and discover how to pray with freedom and joy. Hear now the reading of the Word of God. It depicts one of the most crucial and incisive encounters in the ministry of Jesus. It's recorded for us in the 10th chapter of Luke, the 25th through the 28th verse. Hear the Word of God. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. I pray that the Spirit of the living God will bless this reading and help us to understand its implications for the adventuresome life that the Lord has for us to live today. Let us pray together. Holy Father, we are your children and we belong to you. You sent your Spirit within us so that we could cry out, Abba, Father. In Jesus Christ, you have taught us what it means to be your children. You have given us the courage to surrender ourselves to your will, asking that your will be done. And now, gracious Lord, help us to discover the quality of life that you mean for your children to live, with you and with each other, with the needs of the world. Pour out your power. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Some time ago, my son Andrew gave me a very interesting gift. It was called the Black Male Diet. Uh, he may have observed that there was an extra few pounds here. Would you believe three or four or oh, maybe even five? And the book uh, that contains this diet describes the author's experience with blackmailing himself into dieting. He needed to lose 55 pounds. 
And so he put $5,000 in trust, which could not be drawn out for anything. And if he did not lose the 55 pounds in a year, the $5,000 would go to the American Nazi party. He blackmailed himself into reducing. And by the end of the year, the $5,000 was saved. He was uh, minus 55 pounds, and he felt a lot better. Blackmailing ourselves doesn't always work, however. We blackmail God at times. Have you ever said to yourself, uh, I'm going to promise to do something with the hope that God will recognize my efforts and pay me off. Have you ever said to God, Dear God, if you take care of this situation, I will do that or stop doing that. Or have you ever uh, said when you're concerned about a loved one, Lord, if you take care of my loved one, I will never again under any circumstances do this or that. Now, have you ever done that? Have you ever said that to God in your prayers? It's called conditional praying. It's bartering for a blessing. It's blackmailing God. We even go so far to say, Dear God, you've got to give me this blessing because without it, I'm not going to represent you very well in the world. I need your strength and your courage, the answer to these prayers by your power so that I can show the world what you're like. Now, Lord, take care of your person and do what you need to do. Now, usually the things that we barter are things we need to do anyhow. You know, if we say, dear God, I will stop this habit if you will just take care of me. If you will answer my prayers, I'll never do that again. <laughs> Probably we needed to stop the habit anyhow. And so the barter isn't very satisfactory. And then what do you do if you spend your life bartering with God and run out of things to barter? You know, if you spend your whole life saying, Lord, I'll stop that or I'll do that, and you do that every day of your life, you're going to run out of things that you can do, and eventually you have to trust him for his love just as he is. Recently I spoke at a conference. I talked about the excitement of being filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I described the time many years ago when Christ came and took up residence in my life and I began to be able to live by his power and not on my own strength or training or talents. What a difference it made. After finishing the description, a man came up to me and he said, I want that power. What do I have to do to get it? Now, he wanted that for himself. He wanted his heart warmed, and he wanted to feel the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ around him. He took no thought of radical ministry or of what that might mean for him in terms of his caring for other people. He just wanted it for himself. He wanted that tingling sensation from the top of his head down to the soles of his feet of the electric current of the presence of Jesus Christ in his life. He said, I've prayed that prayer now for 20 years. I've said, Lord, baptize me with your power. Come live in me. Give me your strength. Give me your courage. And he said, it hasn't happened. Why? What do I have to do to get it? Well, as we talked, I began to recognize that he was uh, trying to entangle the Lord Jesus around his own perpendicular pronoun. It was all I. Everything he wanted was for himself. And he had missed the discovery that the power of the indwelling Christ and all of his love is given so that we might be love mastered, love motivated, and love ministering. When I described that, and I said, what's your boldest dream? If you could throw caution to the wind, how would you act? How would you care for people? What would your life be? And as we sat, he began to describe it. He said, well, I'd trust the Lord with my life. I'd give him my agenda. I'd think about people more than about myself. 
I'd really believe that through my conversation, lives could be changed and I could get into difficult situations and the Lord would give me wisdom and strength. And he described the image of a Christ-filled, empowered person, a love-mastered human being. And I said, go and do it and you will receive that dynamic experience of the indwelling Christ for which you have been praying and longing and aching all through these years. And he did. And it happened. Christ happened. Christ, the living Lord, took possession of his life. And I couldn't help but feel that here was the replica, the reincarnation of the lawyer who came to Jesus and asked the question, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Picture the scene. The disciples are seated around Jesus. Added to the disciples are those among the 70 who had been sent out on a missionary journey. They're talking intently about what had happened. You remember Jesus sent them out two by two in his name and in his power. And they came back and they could not wait to share what had happened. Using his name, they had healed the sick. They had cared for the discouraged and the depressed. They had helped in reconciliation and it encouraged other people. And miracles had happened. And they came back and said, Master, this thing works. What we've seen in you has worked through us. Now, off to the side of the crowd, Picture that lawyer. Look very intently. He's dressed in the official garbs of a scribe, for lawyer in the New Testament means scribe, one of those given the responsibility of caring for the legalities of the Mosaic law and the interpretation into the contemporary situation of all of the particulars of the law. To so spell it out, that was the responsibility of the scribe. But look more closely. What is it on his forehead? Do you, do you see it? There's a strange little leather box right at the center of his forehead. And that box is attached to some leather thongs that go around the back of his head. The same kind of a little box is on his arm. What is that? And then we remember, why, that's a phylactery. And what's inside a phylactery? The reproduction in tiny Hebrew letters of Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. The Shema. When the Lord gave the basis of the law to Moses, he said that his people were to carry that with them. Put it on the lintel of their doors. Put it in to the phylactery, a container, a little box between their eyes and their forehead. And what did it say? Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, picture the lawyer, his phylactery in place on both his forehead and his arm. He observes the excitement that the disciples are expressing, and he longs to have the quality of life that they have with the master. They're all seated, and suddenly he stands up as if drawn by some, some mysterious force. He cannot control himself. What must I do to have what you have? is his question in substance. And Jesus said, uh, how do you read the law? What does it say to you? How gentle of the master. He could have easily said, listen, young man, read what's on your forehead. And instead of that, he allowed him with schoolboy fashion to stand in front of all of them and repeat the Shema with perfection but strangely with an addition, an addition that the master himself had made all through his message, not only heart and soul and might, but mind. That was something new, not recorded in Deuteronomy. It had come from the message of the master. So he had listened 
This was not some antagonist, not some disruptor of the meeting. This is a lawyer who wanted to know, what does it mean to use your mind to love the Lord? And after he had repeated it, the Lord simply said, go do that and you shall live. You see, that lawyer had all of his relationship with the Lord on the basis of a conditioned quality of love. What must I do? What must I achieve for God to love me? There was really no answer that the Lord could give him, for he had repeated the scripture. Now all he needed to do was to live it. So very often our relationship with the master is conditioned on what we can do. And when we can't do it to our own satisfaction, we feel that we must somehow condemn ourselves and not receive all that the Lord wants to give us simply because we haven't measured up. That's where that young lawyer was. He hadn't measured. He hadn't fulfilled the qualifications. He hadn't lived that out, and therefore he couldn't receive all that the master had to give him. And so to dispute with Jesus what he said, rather than admitting, rather than confessing, Master, I haven't lived that way. Instead of that, he said, who's my neighbor? And Jesus told a parable that described not the answer to who's my neighbor, but whose neighbor are you? And it's all in the word, by chance. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, check it. It says that a man fell among robbers and was beaten and hurt and was there along that 22-mile treacherous road from Jerusalem to Jericho, waiting, hoping that someone would come along. First of all, a priest came, and then a Levite, and then a Samaritan. But Jesus says, by chance, by chance, the priest came along. In Greek, the word by chance means the confluence of circumstances. What Jesus was doing to that young lawyer was to lead him beyond a bartered love, beyond blackmailing God for blessings, to begin to discover coincidental living. What he was suggesting was that the Lord wanted to call that young man into a cooperative ministry with him in the healing of the battered and the broken, the sick and the hurting. What a difference it is to live with God in bartered, conditional love. Lord, if you'll bless me, I will do. And to live coincidentally in which we move out into any one week or day of our life saying, Lord, you are master of circumstances and you will bring them together so that I can be your person and express the quality of love you have given me. So what this means is that you and I have been called to live on the Jericho Road. If we belong to Jesus, who is the Good Samaritan, really, the one who cares for the broken and the hurt and the battered, if we belong to him, then our ministry is to look for the confluence of circumstances in which we can minister in his name. And so when the phone rings, pick it up in the name of Jesus and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? When someone calls on you for help, don't resist them. Anything we have in knowledge, experience, financial resources, or opportunities are all in preparation for the Jericho Road. The Lord puts everything together in perfect unity. When we are in need, he sends people to us. When people are in need, he puts them on our path. And when they are there bleeding and broken, they are his love to us to enable us to minister in his name so that the flow of his power can come through us to them. Are you living conditionally, saying, Lord, if you love me, I'll love? Or are you living coincidentally, looking for the coincidences in which the Lord will use you as his agent of healing and power. I have a good friend who's a Scotsman. His name is John. 
He starts every day the way I pray you'll start the day. Good morning, God. This is John. I'm reporting in for duty.